Hey all, and welcome back. So in the first few episodes, we discussed architecture, theory, and how chips work. Pretty boring. Well, today we're getting into the fun stuff. We'll start building the CPU, clock, and reset module on the breadboard. This is the exciting part of the project, taking everything that we've learned, combining it, and making something useful and fun. Before we get started, I do want to thank everyone for watching, commenting, liking, subscribing, and sharing. The more that you like, share, and subscribe, the more YouTube suggests my videos, and then it gets it to a wider audience. Like I said, this is the fun stuff. And by the way, does anyone else find themselves making circuits that you don't necessarily need but are a fun challenge to pull off? I did this the other day using a few transistors and a 555 chip to pulse red LEDs and sound an alarm at the same time. I just wanted to see if I could ramp up the LEDs, then bring them back down rather than just turning them on and off. It was a lot of fun to build. Let me know in the comments if you find yourself doing the same. Anyway, let's get into this. Here's a quick overview of what we're going to build. I have the 555 driven slow clock. This will let us slow down the clock for any troubleshooting that we need to do. Over here I have the clock oscillator that will be the fast clock. This will be switchable using a jumper. We have a reset circuit here that will hold the reset line high for a short amount of time to give the chips time to stabilize on power up or to reset the entire computer if we push a reset button. Here's the bus that will be connected to the back plane once we create the PCBs. Over here we have the CPU itself. Down here we have some pins for LEDs on the reset, halt, and clock, and wait. And then over here we have an inverter plus the pull-up resistors for the CPU input pins that are active low. The wait, interrupt, non-maskable interrupt, and the bus request. One of the other things we could put in here is a watchdog circuit that would monitor the clock pulse and if it stopped it would do a reset. But since we're going to be stopping the clock on purpose at times, I don't want to put that in yet. It's basically just a 555 setup as a monostable oscillator, but gets reset by the clock pulse. But if the clock pulse doesn't occur, the output of the 555 goes high and triggers the reset. If you want me to do a demo of that, drop a comment below and I'll do a quick one-off video demonstrating that. Alright, here I have my breadboard set up for the clock and the reset circuit. So let's add the 555 for the slow clock. And then we'll add power and ground. Again, keep in mind that the ground is pin 1 instead of pin 4 like on the logic chips. Get that in there. Alright. There we go. And then we want to tie pin 4 high since it's the active low reset. And then pin 5, the control, is tied to ground through a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. Now, let's connect pins 2 and 6, that's a threshold and the trigger. And then the next components are what set the frequency and duty cycle of the clock. So we'll add a uh, 1K resistor between 5 volts and pin 7. And then we'll connect pins 6 and 7 with a 4.7K resistor. And then we'll ground pin 5 with a 1 nanofarad capacitor. So these three components, the capacitor and two resistors, set the frequency. We may change them in the future. Now, to improve the stability of the output wave, I want to add a 10 microfarad capacitor between power and ground, pins 8 and 1. This is especially important on a breadboard. There we go. So that's our slow clock. For the fast clock, I'm going to add a 1 megahertz clock oscillator um, right here and uh, wire it up with uh, power and ground. That's all it really needs. So let me get the, uh, the power hooked up here. And then I'll hook up the ground and then we'll be able to use the output. Now, since I want to be able to choose which clock is going to be used as the input, I'm going to use these pins and a jumper to select the clocks. So I'll put that right here. And uh, there's the jumper. Put that on there. And then I'm going to tie the slow clock 
to the leftmost pin, so it's pin three of the 555 to that first pin there. Let's get it in there. And then I'm gonna tie the uh, fast clock to the rightmost pin. And that way the middle pin is the output and I can select by just by moving the jumper back and forth if I want fast clock or the slow clock. But if you look at the Z80 user guide, we can see that the clock is actually inverted. So I'll add a 74 HCT14 Schmidt trigger inverter chip. This will not only invert the clock, but it'll give us a nice clean square wave. I'll get power and ground added here. And then I'm gonna run the middle pin from the jumper to pin one, the input on the, uh, on the inverter. And there we have on pin two, our uh, clock output. So let's hook up the scope and take a look at what we have. All right, so I'm gonna add power and move back to the slow clock. And let me get my uh, get my scope hooked up to it here. There we go. Get the ground, and then the signal itself. There we go. And now we've got a 106 kilohertz clock. Switch it over, and there's a. Well, let me reset it here. Hold on. There, there's a one megahertz frequency clock. The waves are not a square, but it'll still work for our purposes. Now, if we look at the user guide for the Z80, you can see that the reset, which is active low, needs to be held low for at least three clock cycles for the reset to take effect. Well, along with this, we, the reset should be held low on power up to allow the power to stabilize on all of the chips. We can again use a 555 timer chip to accomplish this. By setting up a monostable circuit this time, when pin two is grounded, the output will be held low for a period of time. That period of time is determined by the values of a capacitor and a resistor. Let me explain. During normal operation, pin two, the trigger, is held high by the pull-up resistor. Since it is held high, the output is held low. But when pin two is grounded, the capacitor hooked to pin six is discharged and the output goes high. When pin 2 is disconnected from ground, the capacitor begins to charge through this resistor, and once it reaches full charge, the output goes low again. Well, let's get it set up and demonstrate. So I'll add the 555 and get it powered up. Get that in the right holder. There we go. And then we will uh, tie reset to high. And then we'll add a decoupling capacitor to pin five, the control pin. And then I'll tie pin two high with a 10K resistor. Now to get the power for the RC circuit, I'm gonna add a resistor between five volts and pin seven. So I'll just tie pin eight and seven there. And then I'm gonna tie pin seven to pin six for the uh, capacitor recharge supply. So it'll supply, it'll recharge through that resistor. And then we'll add the capacitor between pin six and the ground. Now I need to add a push button so we can ground pin two and trigger the uh, reset. So I'll put that right there. And I'll tie one leg of the pin to pin two of the uh, 555, right there. Get in there. There we go. And then I'll tie the other leg straight to ground. Now, just for demonstration purposes, I'm also going to put a um, an LED B3 
between the output on the 555 and ground through a resistor so that we can see when this circuit is activated. So I'm just going to tie it here. It's actually in the hole in between the, the switch pins. And then I'm just going to use this uh, resistor right here between that and ground. All right, now let's plug it in and try it out. And there we go. However, the reset is active low, so we'll have to invert that. So let's connect the output pin three to pin three of the inverter that we already have. I'm going to pin three to pin three. There we are. So that makes pin four our actual reset output. There is one last thing on this reset circuit, however. We said we wanted a reset signal during power up to allow the power to stabilize, but that didn't happen when we plugged it in. How can we fix this? Well, let's think about what we're asking. When the power is off, pin two is low. The capacitor is discharged. However, as we have it set up here with a 10K resistor going into pin two, when we turn on the power, pin two goes instantly high. How can we prevent that from going instantly high? Well, anytime we're talking about a delay, the first thought should be an RC circuit, a resistor, and a capacitor. So we already have the resistor, the 10K resistor, between 5 volts and pin 2. If we added a capacitor between pin 2 and ground, then during power up that capacitor would have to charge first, holding the pin low. We only need a half second or less, so it doesn't have to be a large capacitor. So let's look at the data sheet of the NE555. It shows that pin 2 will set the output high when it is less than one half of control. And control shows that it's normally two thirds of VCC, which in our case is five volts. So if we multiply five times 0.67 to get to two thirds, and then divide that by two, we can see that we would need to hold pin two to less than 1.67 volts for a few milliseconds. So if we take our RC formula, which is time, equals resistance multiplied by capacitance. And we know our resistance. Our resistance is 10K. And we kind of have a target time, but let's go ahead and make it one second just to keep the math easy. So we need the capacitance. So let's switch that around to capacitance equals time over resistance, which would be one second divided by 10,000, which would be 0 0.0001 farads, or 100 microfarads. Now, that's a rather large capacitor to use in this reset circuit, so it would probably be better if we made it smaller. So what if we divide it by 10 to get something a little more manageable? In order to divide by 10 here, we'd have to multiply our divisor by 10, which is we'd have to make the resistance 100,000. So let's go over here and make the resistance 100,000. Which would then equal 0 0.00001 farads or 10 microfarads. And I think that's what we use. So that'll give us a delay of one second. So if I change the 10K resistor for a 100K resistor, and then add a 10 microfarad capacitor between two and ground, Let's see what happens when we plug it in. And there we go. We have our reset light. And I push the button, get it again. Now we probably didn't need it for that length of time, but it's not gonna hurt anything. Now you may be looking at that resistor and saying, wait, that's not a 100K resistor. And you'd be perfectly right to think that. Notice that the color bands are brown, black, and white. 
That is actually the colors for a 10 giga ohm resistor. But I did measure it, and it is 100K. I got an entire batch of 100K resistors with a white band instead of a yellow band. It caused me some confusion at first, but it does show you that you should always test your components when you get them. You're obviously not guaranteed anything. All right, so that's it for the reset circuit. Next, let's add the CPU to this and get it all wired up. Okay, so here we have the clock and the reset circuit as we left it. I'm going to start by adding another breadboard for the CPU. Come on, there we go. All right, and then I'm going to add the power and the ground for the board. go and now for the part that we've all been waiting for the Z80 now on the last video someone asked how we know the chip orientation well there are a couple of ways by far the hardest is trying to make out the printing on the chip if you can read the words then this is then uh, this is pin one over here on the left hand side right there but the easiest way is to find the half moon cutout on the chip the pins on the cutout side are 1 and the number of pins the chip has, in this case 40. And it goes from 1 to 20 here, and then 21 through 40 over on this side. That's pretty standard on any chip. But it is a good question if you're a beginner, so keep asking the questions if you don't know. So let's go ahead and put the chip on the board, and uh, we'll stick it, well, we'll stick it right here. Let's go. All right, and now we need to hook up uh, power and ground. Power goes to uh, pin 11, which is right here. Of course, I place the chip where there aren't power holes. And ground goes to pin 29, which is over here. Okay, now we need to add the clock from pin 2 on our inverter up here and to pin 6 over here. So we'll hook that up. There we go. Pin 6. And we need to hook up the reset from uh, pin 4 on the inverter to uh, pin 26 on the CPU. Let's get that in here and then go over to pin 26, which right there, nope, right there. That'll hold it high until we uh, push the button to, uh, to reset it and then it'll draw it low. Now, if we take a look at the schematic, we have these 10K pull-up resistors to put on the weight, interrupt, non-maskable interrupt, and bus rec pins. So we'll put them in, that's pin 24 for the weight, uh, pin 25 for the uh, bus request. There we go. Come on. And then uh, interrupt is pin 16, so we'll tie that high. Let's see, 16 is 20, 19, so 16 right there. Okay. And then 17 is the one right next to it. It's a non-maskable interrupt. Pull that high. Now that's all wired up for what we're doing today. The next step is memory. But how can we test this? Well, we know the M1 is a constant signal, so what if we hook the scope up to it and look, look for activity? Let's try it. Okay, so I have the scope hooked up. Let's uh, plug it in. Oh, and it went high. M1's high. And, yep, we've got a signal. It keeps dropping low. Now, what happens if we press the reset? Well, oh, yeah, that's better. What happens if we press the reset button on the CPU? 
let me yeah press this, the reset button it goes high again and then it restarts it's exactly what we wanted all right so there we are we have a cpu clock and reset boards done so join me next time when i add rom to the system and play around with some assembly language seriously thank you for watching and remember to visit my website for the schematics to this and, and other good info have a great day